Ama gyan temeran Ama gyan temeran dasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshu malitam jena tasmai shri guruve namaha Sri Taitanya Manopistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svapadantikam Panchakalpa Trubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha Patitanam Pavnebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Sri Vasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 Um, let me just see who's here now, the participants. Okay, so there's six of us here now. Um, so we need one person to select um, speakers and um, go through them. H who hasn't done that yet? Anyone? I've done it. Prayag? Yes, I'm happy to do it. Excellent. Thank you, Prabhuji. Um, so I think uh, we're on number 12. EMOS is an effective way to achieve individual and institutional integrity. Um, so could you get someone to read that evidence? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Sadat Prabhu, would you like to start us? <laughs> sure. EMOS is an effective way to achieve individual and institutional integrity. <clears throat> Simply enforcing laws and ordinances cannot make the citizens obedient and lawful. That is impossible. Throughout the entire world, there are so many states, legislative assemblies and parliaments, but still the citizens are rogues and thieves. <laughs> Good citizenship therefore cannot be enforced. The citizens must be trained. So <clears throat> put, the, put the, all that in your own words, Prabhuji. <laughs> So simply by having rules and regulations, uh, people will not, sim yeah, simply by having rules and regulations does not necessarily mean that people will follow them. Um, there needs to be um, some form of education training in order to develop um, citizens of good quality. No, okay. it's, it's, uh, would someone like to understand Siddharth Prabhu's um, understanding? Yeah, I will. So I think you said, Siddharth Prabhu, that um, uh, it's not sufficient for to impose uh, laws, regulations, and so forth, um, because um, because people still remain as they are and they don't necessarily follow. Um, and the, the only thing that will work is training so that they become, so they um, acquire good qualities. Is that what you said? Yes, you've understood me. Is there anything more? Um, no, nothing more that I'd like to add. Anyone else have anything a different? Or understanding or anything to add? Well, yeah, I'll add something. It just, it, what struck me is that, but still the citizens are rogues and thieves. So it seems that the natural tendency in, um, uh, in the material world anyway, is that we, we tend, to, tend to degrade in our qualities and our characters. Um, so uh, that just reinforces the point really that um, training is required, is essential actually. 
Somebody like to reflect that? Yep, happy to give it a go. Um, yeah. So if, if I understand you, um, Krishna Prabhu, you mentioned on top of what I mentioned that um, you like the bit about, but still all citizens are rogues and thieves. And what you unpack from that is that it seems like in the material realm anyway, it seems like we're pretty much facing uh, an upstream sort of battle that we just constantly being pushed down and it's, you have to endeavor quite a lot to stay afloat, to develop good qualities. So you mentioned that it's almost essential that training education needs to be uh, given. Yeah, you understood me perfectly. Actually, what just occurred to me from what you just said is that it's not just it's not just uh, regular people, but also devotees. If they're not properly trained, there is maybe still the same tendency. Um, that was just a thought that occurred to me as you were speaking. So you're saying that um, even uh, devotees can be rogues and thieves if they're not trained properly um that that this what is being stated here could equally apply in devote devotee society yes i mean <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> a bit harsh to say rogues and thieves <laughs> but um but yes but actually not to acquire the good qualities without training is very it's very difficult without training even if you're a devotee you can still maintain your original materialistic qualities mm. if um uh if you don't have good training right anyone else like to understand um go krishna prabhu I'll just, uh, yeah, yeah go ahead go ahead um just the last part i was a little bit lost finding my mission statement um but i i did find it now so um Guru Krishna Das Prabhu um, was saying that uh, even in the de devotee community, you you can still basically uh, pull your 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 old nature or, or let your old nature accompany you there. Um, uh, so training is very necessary for us, even as devotees. Um, did I understand you? Yeah. Perfectly, thank you. Yeah. And does anyone have anything else they'd like to say about this uh, quotation from the Srimad Bhagavatam? Any further understandings? If not, then um, any responses to this? How, how is it? Um, why is this quote here? What's the uh, the point of this? Why has this been placed under this heading? Anyone? Yes, Siddharth had his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see the hands. I need to look at that. Okay, Siddharth, uh, go ahead. Can you can you um, handle that side of it, Gaur Prabhu? Um, yeah, sure. Just deal with the uh, the hands. Thanks. Um, so from what I understand is that to, yeah, we need, basically IMOS is a way of providing training and regular education to those that want to undergo this sort of training. So um, by following it, we will be swimming against the current. So sorry, we can swim upwards and it's, yeah, and it's a suitable path to um yeah develop good qualities um both individually and uh institutionally if we get enough people to follow it mm -hmm. that's my understanding so would someone like to reflect that okay i can go, go ahead uh so siddhartha prabhu you saying that um that we oh sorry that willing yeah okay emos emos provides uh, 
a way to to basically um, yeah to train devotees. So if we can actually spread it far and wide, then um, those who are willing uh, could take advantage of it and be trained up uh, uh, to be yeah uh, better, better qualified really for association. Um, did I understand you? Yes, you understood me. Just one little thing to add, which is the institution bit, that if we get enough people, ah. we can actually change the Sangha of people, the wider society. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And so, uh, sorry, yeah, go no. ahead, go ahead, Prabhu. No, no. <laughs> sorry about that. So if I understand you, uh, you correctly, um, you're saying that it would also change the quality of the institution. Is that, is that what? Yes, if enough of us take to it and practice it sincerely and to a high quality, um, yeah, there has to be that same level of quality uh, continuously improving and getting stronger with our intellect or mind. Yeah. Can, can I maybe add to this, uh, Krishna Dharma Prabhu? Um, of yeah, yes, of course. Um, uh. Yeah, just maybe as an insight or something like this, but uh, I would I would say that um, willing, uh, you could say willing transformation is much more effective than enforcing stringent laws uh, in that sense. Because if you, uh, you could always see that even uh, those who go to a gym they are willing participants and they are much happier and they the transformation happens in a, in, a, um, in a positive way. It's maybe not a good example, but uh, in society, uh, enforced laws could be, uh, could be opposed and all these things. But um, if you make it a, a high quality, uh, training facility, then an attractive thing, then um, yeah, a lot of a lot of devotees will see the, uh, the benefit in it. And I, I can see it here in our temple as well. And in my own discussions, it's really, really nice how uh, the quality, how, how your interactions with devotees change. Mm. Um, <clears throat> would anyone like to reflect that? Sure, I'm happy to try. So in the large child Chandra Prabhu, you were saying that when uh, laws are enforced, they're not as effective. And when it's willing and taken on, then it has a much more positive and beneficial outcome. And you gave the example of how people willingly uh, go to the gym and um, experience that transformation and are much happier as a result of it. And you went on to say that in your own experience, you've realized um, when people willingly take on this um, training, then you, you, you've seen the benefit of it. Did I understand you correctly? Yes, thank you. My thoughts were a bit confusing, but thank you so much. Yes. That was an insight. And, uh, that was an insight from uh, Neela Chavaru. And Does anyone else have any insights or other responses? The, um, the, the point of this, <clears throat> excuse me, is that um, it applies to ISKCON in as much as um, we have a, a certain <laughs> um, view that, you know, that there's, there's too much of an inclination towards legislative um, policies and, and trying to control the situation in our society through the means of, uh, of laws. Um, resolutions and laws and things like that um and i mean although this is applying to a state situation uh this this uh, purport is actually talking about ram raj and um you know how uh he would he would train everyone he would ensure that everyone was engaged in their in their vanashram duties and so um so that's how a government should operate as well and, and the points made that 
people will, even in the face of all the different laws, I don't think it means that everyone's a rogue and a thief, although there's an increasing number. But, you know, certainly there are a proliferation of such persons despite the law. So the training um, is required. So that's, that's on, on the government, state government side of things. But in ISCON, um, we also see that, you know, the legislation um, doesn't necessarily achieve the result that they hope it will. Um, and really, it's that training, and as Nila Chalapri was saying, that spontaneous um, acceptance of, of an ethos of training, of, you know, it, working cooperatively together and understanding each other, uh, which will bring about integrity individually and institutionally. So, yeah, if anyone wants to reflect that, you, you're welcome. <laughs> Who else have we got? Who hasn't spoken yet? Bridget. Yes. Bridget. <laughs> You've been called out. <laughs> yeah, Isn't so there he is. Um trying to reflect back on that. So even um just generally with the laws that we see today, um trying to impose those laws on the citizens on the public isn't as beneficial as it is with training and you kind of went back to the context <clears throat> of the verse itself which is during Ram Raj's uh, sort of rulership and how he would actually go to the citizens and help train them up in their Varnashram duties as opposed to just enforcing specific laws that oh you're in this sort of Varna and this sort of Mashram therefore you should be doing this but he actually made sure that they were comfortable and trained up in wherever work an ashram that they were meant to um, occupy themselves in did i understand that correctly you did indeed yeah and then in terms of iscon did you catch that uh not quite okay i also mentioned um how it sort of crosses over into iscon and why, why we use this particular quotation um to make this you know this point this 12th uh, statement did anyone um, capture that? Say that, Prabhu. I think you said that during the Ram Raj, this culture of continuous, I, I'm thinking of it like professional, like continuous professional development. Um, so this need of training, education, uh, having that sort of environment, it's much easier to have that sort of environment. Um, sorry. What am I trying to say? If ISKCON facilitated or had that sort of environment, there wouldn't be as many uh, resolutions from like yeah. the BBC and things like that. Not yeah, yeah. exactly. L less bureaucracy is basically <laughs> what we're aiming for. <laughs> you know, train and empower, and then let go. That that's really how this is supposed to work. Can I make a response? Of course. Um, well, it occurred to me as you were explaining this that, um, you know, a government... Uh, do you want to just say what you're res responding to? Yeah, okay. I'm responding to the fact that, I mean, that, um, uh, that you can't impose, well, you can try to impose laws and regulations, um, but it's not as effective as... Um, uh, as training in, um, given to uh, individuals. So what occurred to me was that, you know, in states and uh, countries, you know, they have police forces and, you know, armies and, and law, you know, they can pass laws which, you know, people can be punished if they don't. Whereas in ISCON, that's not really the case, is it? I mean, uh, or people could be banned I suppose but we don't really want to do that um, so it's even more actually applicable to a spiritual society than it is to any other to an ordinary state or district or you know council or something like that so I thought it's a very good point that you were making mm. you're saying that um, in the state they have the uh, the fourth of the four kinds of diplomacy <laughs> <laughs> Thunder, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the rule of law, um, <clears throat> which is 
<clears throat> the ultimate sort of deterrent, you know, that you can be jailed or, or <clears throat> sometimes executed. But we can't do that. <clears throat> We're not going to jail anyone and certainly not execute or anything like that. You know, uh, it's all voluntary. Um, and, you know, if people don't like it, they can vote with their feet and, and just, you know, you've lost them. So it's even more important that, uh, that this kind of ethos is in place, that this culture of training and, um, you know, so that we create the um, cohesion, the integrity within ISKCON, um, rather than trying to enforce it by uh, rules of law and fear the the element of fear basically isn't it yeah yeah thank you that's much better expression expression of the idea than, than i gave but yeah perfectly thank you thank you thank you Bruno. yeah it's a very good point does, uh, does anyone have anything else to add on this one are we all happy with it any dissenting voices Siddharth has something yeah. to say I, I can't see the hands where do you see the hands just, just so he's putting putting his hand up in front of his face. Oh, in front of his face. I think, I, 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 think, <laughs> I think you might be on speaker view, but if you go to gallery, I think you can see everyone on the same screen. And then. Oh yeah. Okay. Where do I find that? More. On the top right hand, I think, next to view. Next to view. Okay. Yes, indeed. Thank you. And then gallery, and then you can ah, see everyone. I think. I can see all your handsome faces. Okay. Nice one. Thank you, Prabhu. Go ahead. Um, so just a question. I don't know if I'm overcomplicating it, but I was just thinking like, um, you know, like the, the nine stages of devotional service, like Shraddha, um, Bhajana Kriya, et cetera, et cetera. And then just even in terms of the Ashtanga yoga process, um, generally we see that rules and regulations are like almost mandatory, right? And particularly for those in the lower modes, um, it almost feels like it, it is mandatory, some level of rules and regulations, but it's like after Nishta, when it comes to Ruchi, that sense of wanting to perform devotional service, it just becomes so much easier. So to me, it seems like if you're quite well situated, that voluntary, you know, that spontaneous devotion is a lot more easier. Whereas if you're not at that level and you're practicing, uh, Vedi Sarna Bhakti, then yeah, like it's it is more rules and rules and regulations, right? You have to chant 16 rounds, or it's somewhat imposed on you, but you may not want to, but you if you take initiation, you somewhat have a vow and things like that. So I was just trying to see it from that perspective and wanted to hear some insights that you may have on this. Well, before I um give my views on the matter. Anyone else like to understand? Can you understand? Go ahead. Okay. So Siddhartha Prabhu is uh, referring to the yoga ladder and um, well not so much the yoga ladder but the, uh, the phases of bhakti and how at a certain stage uh, rules and regulations kind of fall away and spontaneity uh, arises in the heart um, and that's basically what is that's what is um, drawing parallels with with the whole situation maybe in the institution uh, like ISKCON where um, not that you specifically said it but um, that because the devotees are not on that level, um, they are hovering in a lower um, realm. Um, all these, uh, all these, you could say, all the um, the gunk is still being uh, swished around at the bottom of the the barrel. Um, so that's why. Uh, Yes, rules and regulations are important, but the the goal is to elevate those devotees and bring them to a stage uh, through training, uh, get them to a stage where um, the yeah, like the gunk kind of just falls away and the spontaneity uh, arises. In that sense, did I understand? Yes, you did. Very well said as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? 
I understood you to be saying, um, Siddharth Prabhu, that <laughs> although we're saying um, then enforcing laws and ordinances is, is not um, effective and that training is required, uh, you're pointing out that um, in Baidi Sadhana, the, it, it, it's all predicated on, on laws, that, you know, on, on us following rules and regulations, and without which we don't make any progress because we don't have any spontaneous um, desire to practice bhakti. So we're, we're controlled, you know, like <clears throat> Shastra, the, you know, the sadhana is, is a de derivation of this <clears throat> Astra, you know, Shastra, the same thing that it, it's, which controls us. And um, so uh, it does seem that rules and regulations are required. I think that's the bottom line of, of what you're trying to say. Um, even though, I mean, obviously we can opt not to follow them, should we so choose. But if we've taken initiation, then we've made a vow. So that's even more, um, you know, imposing on us that we, we should indeed follow those rules and regulations. So they, they have an important um, place. They're significant, at least in the early stages of Bhakti, until we rise to the Raganuga level and beyond. Succinctly said, thank you. That's what you meant, right? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, did you want to say more? No, I think uh, what you said was good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a very good point also. Um, I think uh, in response that um, th that's absolutely true, but at, at the same time, um, <clears throat> there needs to be a certain, like Prabhupada stressed, um, the importance of uh, inspiring devotees so they would act spontaneously even before they actually were at that level of spontaneity of, Ra of Raganuga. Um, that that was, he was saying, the, the skill of leadership to make them independently thoughtful, to make them, you know, to constantly find ways to inspire them to uh, engage in Krishna consciousness um, and indeed follow the rules and regulations because. Um, you know, we, we find a lot of devotees, as you uh, said, they, they, they don't follow them, they, they, they fall away, and the attrition rate in ISKCON traditionally has been high. Um, we've lost most. Um, I mean, I look back over the years of all the devotees I've known, and most of them are nowhere to be seen now, <laughs> or very rarely to be seen, put it that way. Um, and many have, you know, given up or, or really slackened their practices. So. Um, I think it's still critical, the training and the um, coaching and inspiring is still a critical element, even to get people to adhere to those rules and regulations. But they are required. I think it's a bit like the state, you know, they, they, the hope is that the citizens will be good, you know. Um, it, it, and there is actually, I think one of the Greeks said that um, if the people are good, there's no need for laws. And if they're bad, <laughs> there's, there's no point in laws because they won't follow them. <laughs> you know, so the thing is that um, the laws are there as a framework, um, but, you know, you, you still have to get people to abide by them and to be good citizens and indeed to be good devotees. So, yeah, anyone like to... Uh, reflect that. Um, Anyone? You no, yeah, you're welcome, Prabhu. Go ahead. Um, so I think you, you were appreciating um, Sadat's point about how um it's necessary to have law, um, laws and regulations especially in the early stages of bhakti but you were saying that even in the in those early stages it is important to have this culture of training so that people feel inspired to adhere to those laws <laughs> did i yeah. capture you did Prabhu. thank you very much that's very good anything else anyone like to say shall we move on are we ready 
to, to number 13. So who's next for reading this one? Um, Bridget, Prabhu, would you like to read? Sure. So 13, we advocate for Shiksha and Diksha relationships to evolve naturally from Sadhu Sangha relationships. Sri Jiva Goswami advises that one not accept a spiritual master in terms of hereditary or customary social and ecclesiastical ecclesiastical conventions. One should simply try to find a genuinely qualified spiritual master for actual advancement in spiritual understanding. CCRD 1.35 purport. In your own words? So my understanding is that... Um, Sri Prabhupada is referencing Sri Jiva Goswami here, who was suggesting that when we're looking at spiritual masters or looking to surrender onto somebody, then instead of looking at their material qualifications, we should be looking for the genuinity of their practices within spiritual, um, like a, a spiritual practice, in our case, Krishna consciousness. And then that way we can actually make sure that the spiritual master will actually help us along our spirit in our spiritual practices as well. Okay. So would someone like to reflect that back? Um, Gora Krishna. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so Bridges, I think you uh, referred to the quote how Srila Jiva Goswami is advising that we look for a qualified spiritual master rather than just um, accept one from just a social or material point of view. Um, somebody that can really help us. Was that what you said? Yes. Was, was, there, any, was there anything more that I missed? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, a specific reference from Shri Prabhupada's purple, which is the word genuine um, in terms of the spiritual practices. And I think that's, just to add on to that, I think that's quite important because even within spiritual practices, we can find um, gurus or so-called gurus who are practicing, but they're not genuine about the practice. They're still allured towards the material tendencies and the spiritual tendencies. Okay, so you're focusing on the on the word genuine because you feel that there's some there may be some practicing to some degree spiritual life, but they're not really um, they're not really genuinely um, following uh, all that we understand is required. Was, was yes. anything else? Yeah, you Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, thank you, Prabhu. Anyone else like to do an understanding of that? Nilachar Prabhu? Yeah, Nilachar. Hare Krishna. Um, yeah, so uh, Bridges' point was more about uh, finding a suitable spiritual master. Um, but the, I think the, the, the essence of uh, the statement, uh, and it's got a lot to do with the heading, is that um, naturally uh, you would be able to find a qualified uh, teacher uh, through the method of um, like this discussions that we have. Um, so it's not that you kind of need to go and uh, run around and look for someone. But if there's a culture of discuss, discussing on a on an equal platform, then you will find the eligible person um, in that association. Yeah. Anyone like to uh, reflect that one, um, Siddharth? Sure. Hi, Krishna. Um, if I understand you, Neil Chaitan Prabhu, correctly. You almost put it back to the heading of the yeah, like what we're reading that finding that spiritual master um, should involve naturally. We don't need to go out of our way, in essence. Um, yeah, if we just um, sincerely doing our practices, 
and we honestly just looking, we can just find them within our circles, even perhaps. Did I understand you correctly? Yes, yes. Thank you. Anyone else, anything to add or different understandings? Any responses? Is this how things work now in ISCOM? Our, our concern on this one is, um, and we can read some more of the quotes here, which sort of emphasize that, um, is that it, this doesn't always occur because um, of the culture that, that um, prevails in our society um, where there are, you know, existing spiritual masters, gurus, <laughs> ISKCON gurus, um, and off quite, quite often, and I'm not saying any of you have done this, but <laughs> quite often, and I, I mean, I know it's a fact because, you know, I, I know a lot of senior devotees who teach on the disciple courses and things like that, and they remark how uh, devotees begin to aspire after a guru without ever having met him, spoken to him, on the, the and vice versa, the other guru doesn't know anything about the, the prospective disciple. So, although this particular quotation, you know, Prabhupada is primarily thinking of the traditional scenario where there's the Kula guru, the family guru, and that kind of thing in India, um, it seems to have transferred itself to ISKCON um, as well. Uh, in as much as this um, dynamic occurs, where you know devotees are prone to select someone in terms of an ecclesiastical convention, um, because these individuals are now um, recognised as spiritual masters, and so they think, well, I have to choose one of them, rather than thinking, well, who is that person who is actually guiding me, who is you know actually uh, inspiring me in spiritual life um, because generally the shiksha becomes the diksha Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavatam uh, and therefore we say we advocate for shiksha and diksha to evolve naturally from sadhu sangha relationships so that it's a, you know it develops spontaneously that in time you see okay this person is really cares for me is you know inspiring me in spiritual life um, and then that relationship deepens and can be solidified in due course of time. So that's really what's behind this. Um, would someone like to understand who hasn't spoken lately? Prayag? Yeah, sure. Um, so you went back um, to the point of how um, Shiksha and Diksha relationships um, should naturally evolve from sadhu sangha relationships and you were making the point around how um, your observations in ISKCON are that people tend to look for a spiritual master using ecclesi ecclesiastical conventions um, without really having any kind of relationship and where there's no shiksha then th that that um, natural prog progression to diksha um, isn't as natural so um, you were making the point that we should build these relationships of shiksha with our circles and then from that um, we, we should be able to find some somebody um, to take diksha from. Yeah, you understood me Prabhuji, thank you. Um, does anyone else want to say anything in response to that? Um, yes, maybe I would. Um, <clears throat> Tell me what you're responding to. Um, I'm responding to the fact that, well, this point really, that Shiksha and Diksha relationships should evolve naturally from Sadhu Sangha relationships. Okay. Because um, I, I have, I know devotees who've been inspired by um, senior devotees, gurus, without meeting them, and they, and they feel that you know, just by hearing this, their, their classes and seeing their behavior, that is sufficient for them. And not everybody feels they, they need to have a personal 
relationship and it's not always very possible um you know we, especially in this day where so many sannyasi gurus uh or in normal times anyway traveling so much um so so i'm not quite sure that um you know we we should limit um i mean i suppose this is not limiting but um yeah i mean there are i think and and you know after taking initiation even though they've not met they do actually still feel inspired by that that guru that was my point okay um yeah you're saying that um uh, well devotees uh, are inspired you know they hear classes um and they see the spiritual master um uh, somehow <laughs> i guess on <laughs> Maybe they see him in person coming to the temple or something, um, and they get and they think, you know, well, I like this person. He's, you know, he gives a great class, um, and uh, he seems to be like, you know, he seems to be the real McCoy from what I can tell. Looking at him here, uh, maybe he could be my guru. Um, and you know, although they haven't met and they don't know anything about each other, um, <clears throat> they can aspire and you know follow the process in due course get initiated uh and then perhaps um you know continue to be inspired by that person and maybe get the opportunity for association and you said that actually in this con at the moment that can prove difficult due to the logistical issues arising and <clears throat> there's only a certain number there's 85 i think or maybe 90 now gurus <clears throat> worldwide uh and they and some of them have many disciples, so the opportunity to get their sangha is limited. Mm. Um, and they tell you that, don't they, on the Guru and Disciple course, don't expect to get your Guru's association. So you're saying, well, it may be fine for some devotees. They're happy with that. That They don't expect anything more than that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that works for them. Mm -hmm. Did you want yeah. to say more? Yeah, you und you understood me fine. Um, um, I mean, I, I I do feel that you know a more personal relationship is is most desirable. Um, but in this day and age, I don't know how um, uh, easy it is to achieve that. Mm. And it bet and better that we actually make progress in life. And and you know the relationship of guru and disciple isn't just based on physical proximity as well so okay yes you're saying um it, although you recognize the um you, you know the superiority of having a closer more personal um relationship it's perhaps impractical um under the current circumstances and also in any event the uh, you know the guru's physical presence is not the most important thing it's his um bani his instructions that are the mm. the key yeah because that's um i mean there are many devotees uh, disciples of Srila Prabhupada who never even met him but they're very still inspired by him mm. um uh so and and of course, we have all Prabhupada's books and lectures and conversations and things, but we also have that from his disciples as well, who are gurus. You know, we have so many lectures and books and things from them as well. So maybe the same principle applies. Mm. Yeah, you're saying that um, you know, some disciples never met Srila Prabhupada or they, you know, had very li limited opportunity to see him and certainly no personal interaction. Mm. Um, but they are inspired by him, by his example, by his books and everything. Mm. And that continues to this day. Of course, he's no longer present. Mm -hmm. So, And now the existing gurus are writing their books. Mm. Um, and they can also inspire their disciples via their books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you That's... like to say more? Well, just one thing. I mean... I'd, uh, maybe would need to be clear about exactly what this point, this number 13 point is. Is it suggesting that actually devotees should actually 
um, look for um, a, a shiksha diksha relationship just in those whom they actually discuss um, Shastra with or Srila Prabhupada's books with? Is that is that the idea of it? Um, so you're saying is is the um, intent of this that um, devotees should simply seek their guide, their spiritual master, from those uh, with whom they are discussing and you know having regular association mm -hmm. uh, you're wondering yeah would you like to say anything else um well maybe the i mean that might be the preferable uh, situation to be in but it as i said before i think it's i'm not sure how practical it is in this kind of kind of global village that we live in these days yeah okay yeah you're saying that um you know um what well, you're saying it may not be practical in terms of in the current situation because we live in like a global village so um that how, how is that a problem for i thought that would be like advantageous because then you can associate with people all over the world that's true that. yeah no <laughs> that's true yeah yeah um just a couple of things in response to that is um, we're not advocating that, you know, all we're saying is as a principle, um, we'd like to see this happening. It would involve fundamental changes in the way ISKCON operates. First of all, the most important thing is to implement the culture of hearing and chanting and discussing together like we're trying to do here mm. and have that spread widely. Um, and, you know, so that there's many a whole network of of uh, discussion groups going on and um different levels of devotee are being involved and um engaging and so more, more natural relationships will develop uh, i mean I, here's a scenario that i've often seen where people come to the join you like i was in manchester you were in manchester devotees came they joined they would like we would be there trying to guide them uh, and assist them and really kind of like spending a lot of time with them, understanding their situation. Um, and then at a certain point in time, they'd think, oh, well, I need a guru. You know, I'm, I'm ready now for a guru. Of course, they couldn't look at me or my wife. Not that I wanted them to, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, um, but they would then select someone from the list or, you know, they'd heard a good class, a couple of good classes. Oh, I like this guy. I, you know, let me approach a, a spire from him. Um, and the, you know, then the relationship they'd had with us would be pretty much dispensed with. It's gone, you know. We saw a few go off to India, and you know, one approached a, a guru. Um, he was he really needed to get married, this boy, um, and we knew that, and we were trying to counsel him in that way. And then when he spoke to the person from whom he was aspiring to take initiation, he said, you know, come to India, don't get married, forget about that. And we, and we were like, no, no, you know, <laughs> this is the worst possible advice he could possibly, he could have been given, you know. So this is the kind of background that we have and the experiences we've had. And, mm -hmm. and I've seen replicated numerously, you know, on other occasions, um, which leads us to this, that, uh, that, that, that real, relationships um evolve but more of them that's like now there's just a few of us doing this and it's not the culture uh, and the whole this con situation is is you know geared towards the current setup where there's only these 80 or 90 which is another issue that the gbc you know for 30 years the number of gurus has not increased it's exactly the same number now that there was in 1987, you know, so, uh, and, but the, the membership of ISKCON has, has mushroomed. So what's going on? You know, mm. why is that? I mean, I don't want to open up a can of worms here because you guys are not like, you know, in the same space as me. So I don't have to go there with that, but really we're just advocating for this, you know, that there be this natural evolution of relationships. Of course, sometimes someone may, go outside of that of course that's possible uh, anything's possible but by and large this is the tradition and Prabhupada actually writes that in 
I think it's 41232 that the the famous purple of uh, Suniti, which says that a woman can't be a guru. <laughs> it's in that same purple um, where he says, generally the shiksha becomes the diksha. Uh, you know, generally. So it's not always, but mostly. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Um, yes, yeah. Um, so you were saying that um, your experience has been that uh, you were cultivating young devotees and you knew them, therefore you felt you could, you, you knew what their needs were and you gave the example of one young man who you felt needed to get married but then he was, he was told to go to India by a guru um, which you felt was the wrong advice um, because basically because the guru didn't know the, uh, uh, the devotee. Uh, he didn't know, you know, he didn't have the same experience that you had. So then also you brought up um, the point that uh, there are so few gurus, gurus within um, ISKCON, only the same number as back in the 1980s. Um, whereas the, the membership of ISKCON has, has, increased considerably so there should be more um and more local gurus and things um was that did i miss yeah it? no thank you Prabhu. that's pretty much the essence of it yeah mm. would anybody else like to say anything uh Siddhat, i saw your hand yeah um so yeah as from what i understand not that I'm really part of like the senior management and all that, but yeah, I don't know. In the most recent Guru Disciple course, I think they're trying to emphasize that, yeah, the gurus work more or less in cooperation with the local management. That's why there's a somewhat mentorship system. So it's so that local council is, is still there, that local accountability. It's not just that they have their relationship with the guru. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. You're saying that, um, <clears throat> that there's an emphasis now on um, the need for local accountability, that <clears throat> it's not just that. I think this is like a, a managerial um, a thing, your dynamic you're, you're, you're speaking about, where there's, it's, there's a, a realization, a perception that um, there's a parallel lines of authority where there's the spiritual master with his spiritual authority over the disciple, which is absolute. <laughs> And there's the management trying, endeavoring to get the devotees to do stuff, um, and they can be in conflict sometimes. So there's a, there's a, you know, an effort underway to um, harmonize that uh, and to prevent that conflict, and so that ISKCON can function smoothly. Is yes. that what you, you? Yeah. Yes, precisely. Yes, you said it very nice. Uh, Using the exact terminology that they had in some paper or whatever group is the course. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I mean. It, it's a problem, yes, you're right, and, and they are trying to solve it like that. Um, and the mentor thing, yeah. I mean, I just want to say something quickly about that, because you see, I mean, the current system in ISKCON is you can't be a guru unless you're approved by the GBC, unless, you know, they, they, they give you the, the stamp of approval. And mm. they, call it, they call it by something else these days, but that's just a detail. But it's the same basic thing. Um, but then you're assigned to a mentor, <laughs> who's not approved and you don't really know and you haven't chosen him i mean i i you know you've chosen your guru okay for whatever reason uh but now he you can't reach him but there's this kind of cascading pyramid of authorities coming down to you through the mentor thing structure um so the whole thing's a little kind of skew whiff at the moment in in you know in our view but, but, you know, there's no point fighting it. It's, it's okay. The, the thing to do, I think, is to put in the, um, the necessary uh, culture of hearing and chanting. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that will bring about all the necessary changes and improvements, I think. Uh, that's the only, uh, that's all we're really pushing for. But out of that will come, we hope this, that the natural relationships will develop mm -hmm. uh, in course of time. Um, 
if I can just add to what you're saying, um, that I'm kind of a part of this uh, mentor, like mentor mentee kind of uh, system where I am a mentor for one mentee. I've, I've got only one mentee. He chose me from a, a small little group of eligible uh, mentees, my spiritual master suggested. Um, but the nice thing is that I am training my mentee in the Emos system and he's benefiting so much from it. So um, it could work um, if, if we train devotees uh, in, this, in this method, then from the bottom up, we can bring a big transformation. Yes, that's all. Mm. Okay. Yeah, uh, anyone like to reflect that? What Nilachala said? Well, yes, basically, uh, Nilachala, you were saying that um, uh, you have personal experience. You, you were a asked to be a mentor by your spiritual master and your experience has been that it's you've been it's given you the opportunity to actually train someone a devotee a dis, uh, in um, in the imos system and that he's benefited a lot from that is that it yes you understand me perfectly. Okay. that's wonderful uh Bridget. Excuse me, I just, I just had a question off the back of something you mentioned, Krishna Dharma Prabhu, um, around, uh, well, from my understanding, it seemed like there were some reservations around like having the, a mentorship system in order to kind of get trained up and actually then be ready for initiation. Um, so my question there was like, in terms of the reservation itself, because if we see it as Nila Chandra, Ch Chandra Prabhu was kind of alluding to like he's been trained up he's being trained up in the Imo system and I'm sure there are many of the devotees who are being trained up not necessarily with Imo, the Imo system but you know their own sort of learnings and understandings through Shri Prabhupada's teachings but then isn't the mentorship system itself a form of training so that those who are not um so well adept to Krishna consciousness can then come to a platform whereby they can, uh, using their own intelligence, actually decisively understand the difference between what should provide wanted versus that which is mental concoction itself. Okay. Um, yes, you're saying that um, just in terms of my reservations about the mentorship uh, program, and that, um, and you're pointing out that. Um, you know what we're advocating for is training uh actually um but isn't the mentorship uh system actually geared toward doing that and providing training and, and obviously devotees need it uh, when they come um cold from the material world um and um know nothing whatsoever about krishna consciousness of course they need training they need to, to be guided in in what should and should not be done um, and hopefully introduced to the culture of hearing and chanting as Neela Chalaprabhu is doing with his uh, one mentee in South Africa. So um, I think, is that what you're saying? Correct, yes. Thank you, Prabhu. Would you like to say anything else? No, that's... Yeah, I mean, that, that would be wonderful if... Uh, I mean, <clears throat> we, we kind of steer clear a bit of that kind of terminology. I mean, mentor... Um, if it's about giving prescriptive advice of any kind, I mean, you know, we've learned over the years that <clears throat> doing that is not a great idea because you can get it wrong and <laughs> very frequently do. And then the person, they see you as an authority, they follow that advice and then it doesn't work out for them and the relationship goes sour. And, and this is another issue that is quite rampant in our society guru remorse having selected someone at an early stage of your devotional service or you know some authority and then realizing later on that you don't agree with them and you don't like what they're telling you <laughs> you find yourself in a bit of a fix um so we try to steer away from that and and 
the, 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 you know, the ethos here is trying to get devotees to think for themselves uh, and to make that connection with Krishna in the heart uh, and with Prabhupada especially through his books and to be able to the Dhami Buddha Yoga and get the intelligence to make their own decisions. So my reservations around mentorship are, you know, that it isn't by and large like that. I mean, Neela Charaprabhu is doing it like that and that's fantastic, but I don't think many are. Um, and I, I, you know how it works uh, is is a concern, I think, for me. Um, and if we could implement this um, uh, sadhu sangha imos pr uh, process into the system, uh, then it would be wonderful. That's what we envision that there is a like a structure in a sense, but it's very flat. It's not that there are these you know, individuals who are telling you what to do, when to do it and how to do it, but training you how to think, to do it for yourself. That's the important thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, so just trying to reflect that back. Um, so first thing was around how, like, yes, whilst there, whilst there are mentorships, etc., cetera, um, but they're not necessarily trained up themselves to actually give the right sort of direction to the devotee to, to use their own intelligence and their own um, judgment to actually navigate through spiritual life um, from understanding of what you're saying with experiences that you've had or heard about. A lot of it is still very much based on prescriptive sort of advice, which could be wrong as well. And therefore there might be fallout between the mentee and mentor because the mentee might find further down the line that actually, no, I didn't, actually agree with this sort of um, approach but they went with it because they saw the mentor as an authority figure and so you concluded by saying that it, it would be nice if the whole Ima sort of training sort of system was implemented into the mentorship so that the mentor themselves could be trained up in understanding how to train the mentees in using their intelligence and Krishna consciousness so that they could follow what Shri Prabhupada was trying to implement for his disciples absolutely did you did understand me yes thank you Prabhu. Yes. yeah and, and just um I, I should have picked up on one point also god krishna Prabhu made earlier about um shila Prabhupada, and that's how it worked that he was like a remote figure for many of his disciples and um and they you know um had to depend on his instructions well yeah but uh <laughs> He wrote 60 books of, you know, profound transcendental wisdom, which alone are capable of liberating you. Um, and he, you know, set up a structure of worldwide institution. And he, um, and he did personally respond to every single inquiry any of his disciples ever made, um, which I know for a fact that most of the gurus, especially those with many disciples, are just not capable of emulating at all. You know, I mean, it's, some have written a few books and that's wonderful. But as for dealing with the individual, you know, inquiries and everything of their disciples, they find that extremely difficult, if not impossible. Um, and, you know, so there's, it's hard really to make that sort of comparison. I think we shouldn't, I think, you know, imitating and following are two different things and we need to be careful not to cross the line into, into that one, you know. So, yeah, I, I meant to pick that up earlier. Sorry, Go Krishna Prabhu. I don't know if you want to understand that, but that was just uh, in because you, you did use Prabhupada as an example and say that current gurus could be compared to him. But I think there's a quite a big difference <laughs> personally. Um, yeah, no, I take the point. It is a good point. But at the same time, I feel that, you know, Prabhupada, he could also make advanced devotees, pure devotees. And we shouldn't, you know, otherwise it's a bit like what the Ritviks say that, you know, only Prabhupada is the one. And we, I don't think we should undervalue, you know, his disciples who are gurus, even though they may not be on his level. Um, but, yeah, you know, that, that, that's a fair point. You're saying, you know, obviously should Prabhupada is, cap was, is capable of making pure devotees. So we shouldn't denigrate those who uh, have taken up the role um, of being guru after him. Um, 
and that you know uh, they they could also be uh, Mahabhagavats and Uttama Adhikaris like him, you know, seeing Krishna face to face and and everything else. Um, so let's not you know be a, a, um, miserly in our estimation <laughs> of their of their qualities. Yeah. Sure, I mean that that that's that's fine. I mean I, but I know that they are themselves saying that they're struggling. I mean you know. <laughs> The, <laughs> I'm aware of what's going on, and and the um, and recently the GBC have introduced an initiative where the existing spiritual masters can select from their own disciples um, successors. You know, those who can take uh, the second generation gurus who can begin to you know take over, and they should they're supposed to retire at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of them have had to stop giving initiation because they're struggling. So so there that element is there definitely that they they're overloaded um, with, you know, too many disciples. But I mean, yeah, fine. It, you know, I mean, the thing is, an important principle for us also is that you you choose your guru and it's up to you to decide and, mm -hmm. y you know, it, whether he's qualified or not. And it doesn't make any difference what anyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. um, I would never try to impose my view of a particular person on someone else because it's subjective. I'm, I'm looking through my lens, my conditioning, um, mm. and my envy and my, you know, all, all the problems I have. So um, it's not for me to say that this one's not qualified or anything like that. And that is one of the reasons why we don't like the current system, which operates on that principle that rather than the disciple making his own independent decision based on his own uh, understanding of Shastra and everything else, his maturity, um, it's imposed upon him by someone else. Mm. Uh, the view, you know, you may choose someone, I think this person's qualified, he's a Mahabhagavat and everything else, but then he doesn't get the rubber stamp for, <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, that can happen. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just going into that a little bit here, but... Um, mm. But I'm just agreeing with you that, yes, they can be advanced devotees. I'm not doubting that for a single moment. Uh, and we're not, you know, uh, criticizing the existing gurus. We're just saying that let's open things up more. Let's have a culture where the hearing and chanting is going on and the relationships are forming naturally. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I accept that point thank you but just one point about um, the mentor sy mentorship system i mean in leicester where i am at the moment um trying to introduce it and it's very much a spiritual thing and it and and it's and the, the mentors are approved locally you know by you know because obviously they're people known to the temple president um and so forth um so it's not that they're then not approved they are approved, but not in some formal GBC sense. But and also, it's it's really just a it's a um, it's a spiritual thing. It's not like telling people oh you should get married or not get married. Or um, I mean, it may just be giving them um, uh, the you know encouragement to follow their their spiritual practice basically. Because everybody, every individual has to take responsibility. That's basically what you're saying, isn't it? That um, you know, you select, and it's and it's your guru, and it's your responsibility to re select in, intelligently. Um, so it's the same, basically, with um, the mentorship. I think. Yeah, you're saying that um, first of all, mentors are approved locally by some board or local or temple authorities or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, they assess them and say, yeah, this guy's suitable or this lady is suitable to be a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're assigned to um, the new devotees or the new devotees select them. I'm actually not quite sure how the process works because I've never been involved with it. But, uh, but it, you're saying it, it, essentially it's spiritual, that they, it's about encouraging them to practice their spiritual lives, mm -hmm. uh, not so much about telling them what to do and what not to do, but um, just really telling them to chant their rounds and, you know, whatever. Read or the help them to chant their rounds. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, give them some kind of um, 
assistance in their yeah. spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, basically, yeah. But I do also agree what you say about that if Imos was Im implemented in that, it would be a great help. Yeah. Definitely, it would be a, a, It'd make a big yeah. difference. I mean, I, I recall the only time I really had some brief contact with mentoring was some years ago. There were sat in the charts and, you know, different things like that, which were, you know, to try and get inspire them with a little bit of peer pressure and stuff. And, and I just thought, well, you know, I, I don't know what it is now. It may not be anything like that whatsoever. It may be, as you say, a, a wholly um, in, just an encouraging, coaching, inspiring thing. But without this process of emos of discussing of of you know getting of showing devotees of, of helping devotees how to think for themselves how to reach the answers to their own questions because you were saying earlier how um you know that that's the important principle um or maybe it was i forget which maybe it was your current maybe it was you or nila Chilo, um that you know within a a, a, a a society that we want people to voluntarily embrace um, the laws, the principles, whatever, um, rather than it being imposed upon them from outside. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is what you should be doing. And are you doing this? And have you ticked all the boxes and everything else? Mm -hmm. But that they, they're trained to come to the conclusion for their own within themselves that, yes, this is what I need to do. And these are the steps I have to take. And, mm -hmm. and if they have doubts and confusions, that they, they know how to answer them. Um, themselves and they're not turning to a mentor or a guru uh, because they do I mean the gurus are beset by disciples approaching them with difficulties and problems uh, you know we, we, we discuss have discussed with a couple of gurus this thing you know just on Shastra and, and one of them would always say to us well it's so refreshing when you and Chintamani come and meet me because you're not bringing all your problems <laughs> and asking me to try and solve them for you you're just discussing Shastra with me, which is what, you know, you really like to do. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, we're, we're just hoping that this can become much, much more the, um, the culture. Mm. And, and as you say, if you can bring it into the mentor system, brilliant. That would be wonderful. Mm. Anyone else or any, any other points? Uh, we, we've got a little time left. We, should we try and tackle this second quote? Um, shall yeah. I allocate somebody? Please do. Um, Nilacho, Chanaru, maybe? Uh, thank you, Prayer. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'll read. Therefore, the so-called formal spiritual master and disciple are not facsimiles of Brahma and Narada or Narada and Vyas. The relationship between Brahma and Narada is reality, while the so-called formality, yeah, formality is the relation between the cheater and cheated. It is, it is clearly mentioned here with that Narada is not only well behaved, meek and obedient, but also self-controlled. One who is not self-controlled, specifically in sex life, can become neither a disciple nor a spiritual master. One must have disciplinary training in controlling speaking, anger, the tongue, the mind, the belly, and the genitals. One who has control, uh, the particular senses mentioned above, is called a Goswami. Without becoming a ghost swami, one can become neither a disciple nor a spiritual master. The so-called spiritual master uh, without sense control is certainly the cheater. And the disciple of such a so-called spiritual master is the cheater. So I'm going to read the first sentence again because something that wasn't clear. Therefore, the so-called formal spiritual master and disciple are not um, copies of Brahma and Narada or Narada and Vyas. The relationship between Brahma and Narada is reality. While the so-called formality, uh, I, 
think there is a spelling mistake here, um, is formality in the relation between the, oh no, is, okay, it's fine. Is the rela uh, relation between the cheater and the, che the cheater and the cheated? Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, what I'm understanding is that um, yeah, it's a little bit. Um, what I yeah, what I'm understanding is that the, there's a there's a, a difference between a, a formal relationship. Uh, a current formal relationship that is established through this uh, um, this unnatural system, this unnatural process, and um, it is not the same as uh, this organic relationship that Brahma and Narada um, has. Um, so. I hope I understood that properly, um, but then later on in the paragraph, it's uh, speaking about um, proper training and uh, that a disciple. Well, let's, let's just stop there. Let, let someone um, capture that first sentence. What you were saying, okay. um, Siddharth, you want to have a go? Oh. So you're falling asleep there. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Should I go ahead? Uh, no, uh, Siddharth, do you want to understand what he just said? I don't think I completely understood what he said. Um, no problem. Did anyone else? Prayag, did you hear? I, I think so. I'm happy to attempt to understand Elisha Prabhu. So you were um, basically discussing this point about or, or di the difference between having a formal relationship in the current system um, of, of guru and disciple and differentiating that between the organic, which is, I think, the word you used, um, relationship between Brahma and Narada. Um, so I think you, you were just highlighting that... Um, that the difference between having the formal relationship um, is basically without training. I think you were go going to go on to further. Did I capture that correctly? Yes. Sorry for having such a confused uh, <laughs> understanding. But yes, that's the gist of it. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Did you want to say more, Neil? Any, anyone else on that first sentence? So before we go further on, because this is actually quite a long paragraph, many points are made in this one. So the first, just these first points here, does anyone have a response on that or a different understanding? Go yeah. Question, bro. yeah. Um, the point is just uh, when he says formal, means that it's it's not a... A genuine relationship is just because it's a family guru or uh, well just basically that's the idea that you know there's many especially in India they have you know as you call it cooler gurus uh, just family gurus and so just a child even at a young age will be initiated um, but it, there's no relationship there really so that I think that was the main point that in this in this first couple of sentences so he then, and then he's saying that such a formality is just a, uh, an arrangement of the cheater and the cheated so there's no real value in it mm. um neil Shafu? can i understand uh because then it'll just help me <laughs> yeah go ahead. thanks okay so, Guru Krishna uh, Prabhu, you're saying that this formal spiritual master, this uh, formality, uh, it's Prabhupada refers to the system that's been prevalent in uh, India, 
where they have uh, uh, established gurus, say, uh, in the, the gurukul system and so on, and family gurus and so on. So uh, you are appointed a guru um, according to your wherever you are in your social re reform formation kind of process. Um, but there's no real, uh, real deep relationship that is organically uh, established. Um, so this basically um, opens up the possibility that your the disciple you um, could be uh, um, unqualified, and then you could be taking instruction from an unqualified person as well, because none of you are on the same wavelength. Really. Did I understand you? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you did. Basically, there should be a relationship of love. I think some kind of loving connection. Um, in other words, the the welfare uh, of the of the uh, disciple should be uppermost in the in the guru. But basically, if it's just a formal relationship, that's not there, and therefore it just becomes a a nonsense. Really, it's it, in fact it's and using the word cheater and cheated um, means that it's actually it's worse than useless. It's actually detrimental. That's what occurs to me. Okay, so I can just reflect. So you are um, emphasizing the word love in a relationship that is important, like a spiritual relationship, uh, where a lot of care is involved in um, instructions in someone's personal life and their dealings and so on. So they have to kind of know the person and care for them, love them at the end of the mm -hmm. day. Because in a formal relationship, uh, it would be more about uh, prestige and um, quantity of disciples and so on. And if you uh, don't understand the disciple uh, and you, even if you honestly uh, instruct him, you might be doing it in a wrong way and cheat him and um, it could have detrimental effects on, on him. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You understood me perfectly. Thank you very much. It's good. Any other points on that? Uh, those first couple of sentences. I think the um, formal relationship, I, I, as uh, Gaur Krishnapur was saying, that it's really mostly, uh, uh, you know, Srila Prabhupada is thinking in terms of the um, the classical situation in India. Um, where you know the guru is neither not quality. I mean, there has been a lot of that kind of thing going on um, in recent times. I don't think he's even thinking about the Vedic age, but I think he's thinking more in terms of the um, the bogus gurus who are floating around, <laughs> who easily accept disciples, and that neither they nor the disciple are qualified in any way. So um, it, that's the, the formality he's talking about. Um, and that it doesn't necessarily apply to our situation, but I think it's something to think about um, that, you know, to ensure, and the rest of the paragraph is really going to deal with the, um, what it means to be a disciple and what it means to be a guru. Um, so I think it behooves us to ensure that, first of all, we're adequately qualified and, and actually the guru should be determining that. He really should. Um, and the, of course, the disciple should be determining if the spiritual master um, has, you know, control, vacha, begum, manasakra, so all these things, tongue, belly, genitals are under control. Um, so that's going to come up in, in a little while. But I don't, I don't think it's, um, you know, I, I think it's important always when we see these things, not to just say, oh, well, yeah, that just, that's just talking about people outside us. You know, because then it has no meaning to us. It's like it was just a used bit of information that doesn't really apply to me. Mm -hmm. So I think it's always important to see, well, how does that apply to me? Can it apply to me? And there's always a way it can, um, I, I feel. 
Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. We are getting close to the end. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to say? Any questions or points before we sort of wrap up for the day? I think well, I feel it's been a very valuable discussion, actually. Yeah. I, I found it stimulating and thought provoking. So thank you very much. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it too. Anything anyone else would like to say? Uh, just to add um, that I, I liked your last point about how it's so easy for us to read these things and think that actually Prabhupada's talking about, you know, whether it's Mayavadis or the general karmis out there, etc. But actually, we should try to understand what does this mean for me. So I, I really like that point. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we are the Maya parties he's talking about, you know, we are the sense gratifiers. Uh, <laughs> you know, we are the, uh, the Gyanis, you know, seeking liberation. I mean, ostensibly, we're, you know, oh, I, I want to go back to Godhead, but, you know, why? Well, because, I mean, I won't suffer anymore. Well, that means you're interested in liberation. You're, you're still Gyana Mishra, you know, or it's going to be nice there. I'll, I'll be able to eat unlimited amounts of food with krishna <laughs> yeah <laughs> still you know it's it's worth always analyzing in in our own heart and seeing that he's really talking to me here <laughs> actually you know yeah so any last points before we wrap uh hopefully i think chintamani will be back in action next week she's um been very tired today so I had to take early rest, so she sent her apologies. <laughs> well, wish her better. Yeah, thank yes. you, brother. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll see you all soon um, next week. Let's see what happens. Uh, but for the time being, Panchakalpa Truvius Char, Kibus Nubiriva Char, Paditanam Pavanibio, Vaishnavirio, Namo Namaha. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thank you for your association. Thank you very Hare. much. Thank you, Prabhu. All glory to the Prophet. Hare Krishna. Hare, Hare. All glory to the Prophet.